This is True Crime Out Loud. I'm your host, B. And I'm your host, Jen. I want to start out by telling you all about a new podcast. It's called M the Podcast, and it's basically true crime with some supernatural. But a lot of people have said, oh, I wish y'all had more episodes. Well, I found this one, and all the episodes are like 15 minutes or less. So if you're in a hurry and you need a true crime fix, go listen to M the Podcast. This week's case is going to take us to Emporia, Kansas. Now, Emporia is a smaller town with a population of about 25,000, and it's located between Topeka and Wichita, Kansas. It is home to Emporia State University, and in 1987, a CBS miniseries titled Murder Ordained was filmed here, and you'll see that that's got a tie-in to our case. The first person we're going to talk about is Thomas Bird, but he went by Tom. Tom was a Lutheran minister. He had two master's degrees in theology. He was also the son of a minister. When he was in college, he was a distance runner, and now he was in his early 30s, and he still ran five miles a day. And his friends and his parishioners described him as being full of charisma. His wife was Sandra Stringer Bird, but she went by Sandy. And Sandy had her master's in math. She had begun teaching at Emporia State University, and she was working on another degree in computer math. People described her as full of energy. So Jen's introduced you to Tom and Sandy, and they're one of two couples that are involved in this week's case. We'll talk about Tom and Sandy and then Marty and Lorna Anderson. Tom and Sandy, they had moved from Arkansas to Kansas in 1982, and that was based on his church assignment. They had three daughters, and like everyone that's got careers going and kids, they were a very busy family. Tom had created growth in his church in just one year. They had added a daycare center, softball and volleyball teams, and the church was really growing and expanding its membership. They met a couple at one of these church softball games named Martin and Lorna Anderson. Martin went by Marty. Marty was employed as the chief medical technologist at Newman Regional Health Laboratory. Marty was a Vietnam vet, and he had served in the U.S. Army and was still a reservist at the time of this case. Lorna was hired by Tom as the secretary for the church, and Marty and Lorna had four daughters. They didn't have that great a marriage. And Lorna had had several affairs and was generally not happy with her marriage. She discussed these marital issues with Tom, and as a good minister does, he was supportive and encouraging and kind of counseled her on those things. But we know on True Crime Out Loud that that can lead to trouble. Now, we've talked about Tom, Sandy, Marty, and Lorna, and all of them are in in or around their early 30s. On July 17, 1983, about a year after Sandy and Tom moved to Emporia, Sandy was found that morning face down in the Cottonwood River just off of the Rocky Ford Bridge. And this is just south of Emporia, but still in the same county, Lyon County, Kansas. And Sandy's vehicle was next to her, and this was an apparent motor vehicle accident. You had state trooper and deputies respond to the scene. It was kind of a a rural area. So they looked at all the landscape and the scene and used their investigative wisdom to surmise that Sandy had come around a sharp curve at the bridge. And from what I was reading, there are two sharp S-like curves before you get to that bridge. So she came down the last one straightening out the curve, I guess, and went down the embankment into the river where she was ejected in front of her vehicle and died. An autopsy was completed, and it showed she had a transacted kidney, which is the kind of injury that is common in a motor vehicle accident. Of course, it was ruled a death due to a motor vehicle accident. So Tom's in a state of mourning, and he becomes closer with Lorna and Marty, and they're there for him after his wife has died. 
But four months later, on November 3rd of 1983, Lorna was driving the family van down the road with Marty and the kids in it. They were coming from Fort Riley, headed back towards Emporia. As we said, Marty was still in the reserves, and I saw some that said National Guard. But either way, he was still in the military service, so they were headed back home. But she began to feel sick. So she pulls to the side of the road and left Marty and the kids in the vehicle. And she goes off away from the vehicle a little bit because she felt she was going to be sick. But she wound up losing the keys. So she calls back to Marty and says, hey, come help me find the keys so we can go. Well, as they begin to search for the keys in the dark on the side of this road, they were approached by a masked gunman who shot Marty in the head with a 22 caliber pistol, and he died on the scene. And a few days after this, because it was a, a murder and it was just unusual for the area, Lorna gets a spokesperson for her, and that spokesperson is Minister Tom Bird. Now, I'm sure that all of our True Crime Out Loud listeners have got their eyebrows raised now, and so did the police, because random masked gunman out in a field where we're looking for our keys shooting and killing one of the two people out there is raising some red flags and you don't have to be a veteran detective to see that so obviously the police are going to launch an investigation into marty's death and they were suspicious from the very beginning just like our true crime out loud listeners a random robbery on the side of the road not likely although Marty did have a $270,000 life insurance policy. Fairly quickly, police hear rumors that Tom and Lorna are having an affair. Tom says that they didn't have a sexual relationship, but he admitted that he was close to her because she was his secretary and that he often had counseled her through her marital difficulties. Police, as a normal course of investigation, they're going to speak to everybody, and that includes friends of Marty and Lorna and Tom, and they're going to talk to everybody's friends. And one of the people they spoke to is Jan Mead. Now, she was a friend of Lorna and a supervisor where Lorna worked part-time with the Heart Association. Lorna had disclosed to Jan as early as February or possibly March of 1983 that she was having an affair with Tom. She would tell Marty that she was going to meet Jan about business, because Jan lived out of town in Wichita, in order to create this time to spend with Tom. She also told police that she knew for a fact in March, Lorna disclosed to her, quote, he's pretty good in bed for a minister. So that doesn't leave a whole lot to the imagination or much room for denial. The police also develop a lead about a possible previous hired hit on Marty. They speak with Daryl Carter, who's a local contractor, and Daryl's also an acquaintance of Lorna and Tom. Carter said that back in March, about the same time she's making these inappropriate comments to Jan, he met with Tom and Lorna at the church office, and they wanted to hire him to help kill Marty. He declined to help them. They went to Daryl's brother, Dan, and Dan said that he received $5,000 in September of 1983 to kill Marty Anderson, and he said he didn't do it. And Dan was the hairdresser of Lorna. Dan Carter is arrested for conspiracy to commit murder because he's accepted money, and he meets the elements, and I'm sure they're going to look closer into whether or not he's the masked gunman. Tom Bird and Lorna Anderson are arrested for solicitation to commit first-degree murder. The police button this one up fairly quickly. So let me cover a little bit more investigative information. Before they go to trial on the conspiracy and solicitation charges, police uncover other information, and they become suspicious of Sandy's accident. And in October of 1984, Sandy's body was exhumed. The trooper on the scene said that there was blood on the bridge and on a tree below the east area of the bridge, which was about 20 feet from the final resting place of Sandy's car and her body. 
Sandy's watch was also found underneath the bridge in the area of the tree with the blood. Now, the Rocky Ford Bridge was built in the late 1800s, and the planks of this bridge are about one to three inches apart. So if somebody's standing on it and something falls, such as a watch, it can go through those cracks. So this kind of looks suspicious. Maybe, maybe not. The blood that was on that tree was type A blood, and it was the same as Sandy's. Now, this blood was also on the west side of the tree. But the vehicle, if you can picture this, was traveling south, and she was theoretically ejected as the vehicle traveled on the east side of the tree. So they're questioning, if she's ejected on the east side of the tree, her blood should not be on the west side of the tree. Dr. William Eckert, he's a forensic pathologist, he did this autopsy after Sandy's body was exhumed. And he agreed with the original doctor on the injuries from the first autopsy. But he found additional information. He said there were fractures of her left shoulder blade. There was a laceration on the top of her head indicating a considerable impact or blunt trauma which would have made her instantly unconscious. There were three linear injuries above the left wrist, and her left wrist was fractured. There was similar injury to the right arm, also above the wrist, and on the elbow of her right arm. Now, you're probably thinking, yeah, she's been in a car accident. She could have blunt trauma to her head. She could have injuries to her arms. But the forensic pathologist, who knows better than I do, said the injuries on the backs of her arm were defensive injuries, where she was fending off some type of attack. He said these linear marks could have come from being struck with something, such as a large tree branch, a baseball bat, pool cue, tire iron, or something similar. He said, yes, she had a transacted kidney, As the original autopsy showed, and he agreed, it is seen in a motor vehicle accident, but he said this injury also could be from falling a height in excess of 20 feet. And we know this bridge above the land was at least 20 feet. He said he saw no injuries that were consistent with being ejected from a vehicle. Now, Dr. Gabriel, the original doctor, said her death resulted by loss of blood due to internal injury caused by blood trauma. So basically, she bled internally and died. He determined that her death would have taken about 30 minutes to an hour after she sustained the injuries when she was thrown from the vehicle and thrown face down into the water. Well, there was no water in her lungs. So if it took her 30 minutes to an hour to die... She had to have been breathing or she would have died sooner, but she didn't breathe in any water. And if she's face down in the water, you would think she would have drowned quick, more quickly than 30 minutes to an hour. Exactly. So the prosecution hired an expert who was an expert in the area of mechanics of vehicles and car rollovers. And he said that the driver's door of the vehicle was torn off and was further up the embankment from where the final resting place of the car was. And with her being ejected, he would have expected to see her body between where that car door was and where the car stopped and definitely not in front of it because she was not ejected through a windshield. She was ejected through that door that was torn off. So she should have been up on the embankment. Also, the interior of the car, they said, showed no hair or blood you would see with someone being tossed around inside of a vehicle. So now that the police have developed additional insight into Sandy's wreck, they reflect back on the story that Tom told them the night of Sandy's wreck. Tom told police that that night they had gone to dinner to celebrate Sandy's new promotion They had then returned home, and Sandy went in to get a bottle of wine and a bottle of whiskey for Tom. They had a babysitter for their kids, and they had told the sitter that they would be home by 1030. They went to his office and had a drink, and then she left to go to her office. He says that he stayed at the office, went for a run, 
and then returned back to the church. When Sandy didn't return, he called the sitter, and the sitter said that she had not heard from Sandy, and that's when he notified police that Sandy was missing. According to this statement, they would have eaten around 7 p.m., but during the autopsy and examination of Sandy, she died within three hours of her last meal, and that would have put her death closer to 10 p.m. So the trip to the house to get the bottle of wine and whiskey for Tom had happened at about 9.30. So that means that less than 30 minutes or about 30 minutes or so from being at the house, she had, was already deceased, according to what they were seeing based on her stomach contents. After she died, Tom discussed her death with a lot of people, but his stories were often very inconsistent. His recounting of events, I guess. Let's talk about the witness, Daryl Carter. Maybe you want to know how they got this information from Daryl and the details. Well, remember, Dan Carter, the brother that was a hairdresser, he was arrested. So Daryl hires an attorney for Dan. Daryl and the attorney go to the jail to meet with Dan. And Daryl reveals to the attorney that this was much deeper than what it seemed. He said in May of 1983, Lorna asked Daryl to meet her at the church office, but he didn't know what this meeting was about. When he arrived, it was Lorna along with the minister. He said they talked of two different plans. The first plan was proposed to him by Tom. He said it could be staged as an accident. Tom told him he had been on a gravel country road south of Emporia and there was a bridge over the river and he thought it was about 50 feet high. He said if someone was drugged or drunk, they could easily miss the curve in the road so they could take Marty and drug him, then take him down to the river, shove his car off the embankment, and it would look like an accident. Sound familiar? So Daryl's role in this would be to pick Tom up from the scene and bring him back into town. He said Lorna would need to be at home so no one would get suspicious and they would make sure that people knew she was at home. The second plan that they came up with was to stage a robbery and a shooting, but Tom and Lorna said they wouldn't need Daryl for this second plan. Daryl said that he was fearful for his own safety so he just told him that he would need to think about it, but he really didn't want to have anything to do with it. He said as he was leaving the church that night, Tom told him, if anyone asks why you're at the church, just say it was to discuss the church youth group selling fireworks at your fireworks stand. Well, a few days later, Tom came to Daryl's job site to ask if he had made a decision. He told him, you know, no, I haven't. But he also asked him, why didn't you try to counsel Lorna and Marty or suggest divorce? And he said Lorna didn't want a divorce. She wanted his life insurance money. He said he loved Lorna and he was doing this to help her. He also said he would preside over the funeral. That way he could be close to Lorna and no one would think anything about it. Plus, he was a minister and no one would suspect him. Daryl tells him that he hasn't made a decision. Well, two days later, Daryl called Tom himself and said, hey, I, I'm not going to be part of this. I'm not going to help y'all. And they have at least two witnesses that said Daryl told them in either May or June before Sandy or Marty died that he had been asked to help kill someone, but they didn't know specifics and they really didn't know if Daryl was telling the truth or not. So Dan was arrested, the brother, that's the hairdresser, was arrested in November of 1983. And the meeting in this jail with Daryl and Dan and the attorney was mid-November. Well, on December 1st, Tom contacted a lady named Jennifer Peterson, who lived about three doors down from Tom. She was also the girlfriend of Daryl. Although Daryl was married with children, Jennifer was his girlfriend. Tom told Jennifer that he needed to talk to Daryl, and Jennifer told him, okay, I'll relay the message and have Daryl call you. Tom told her, no, no phones. So Daryl, when he hears this from Jennifer, he goes and tells the attorney and says, hey, I mean, he has contacted me and he wants to talk to me. 
So they contact the Kansas Bureau of Investigation. KBI tells Daryl to call Tom, and they're going to record it. They made the phone call and decided during this phone call that they were going to meet in a parking lot on December 10th. Daryl was wired, and he met with Minister Bird, and this conversation was recorded. Now, because of Daryl's cooperation, Dan, his brother, was allowed to plead to reduce charge of criminal solicitation, and he was released on four years probation. So here's some other key points that they came up with from the investigation. Witnesses had told police that Tom and Lorna had pet names for each other. They found two cards in Lorna's bedroom from Tom, and one of those cards said, I love you, and I'm confident of the future, and that makes the present okay. The officers who investigated the accident scene and the accident scene photos showed no skid marks or signs of an attempt to try to brake, you know, for the vehicle to apply its brakes. John Rule was the state trooper on scene, and he did not have a good feeling about it from the beginning, and he pointed out things to the deputies but he's not trained to say it's murder you know he's a state trooper so his main purview is traffic accidents and something about this didn't look like a regular traffic accident to him he said that as the sun started coming up while they're investigating this accident scene evidence began to disappear because people were all over the scene and they're trying to get her body out of that gorge under the bridge and they're trying to remove the car and he said there was he told them about the blood on the bridge and the watch under the bridge and he also noted that he didn't like the seat position of the car he felt like the seat was too far back for a woman who was five foot one he just said that above all else nobody would give him the time of day because they just wouldn't believe that anyone had a reason to kill the minister's wife. So Sandy's friends told police that she always wore her seatbelt. And while it's still possible to get ejected, it's unlikely when someone's wearing a seatbelt. They tested Sandy for alcohol, and she was sober. We were unable to locate her actual BAC, which is a blood alcohol content, but articles state that she was sober. So if she had any alcohol in her system it would have been very very low because they would have been able to test and and see that the sitter told police that tom called around 1 a.m asking if sandy had come home he called the police around midnight so he calls police at midnight but then he's going to call and ask the sitter at 1 a.m if she's home so those calls are kind of out of order the sitter said that tom came home in a shirt and tie and that didn't mesh with the story about we I went on a run. Because why would he, if he's coming home in the middle of the night after a run, why would he change back into formal attire? And then one of the most compelling things is the police officer who delivers the news to Tom said that Tom asked the police officer, well, I mean, what was Sandy doing out there? And we never go out there. But then he later on asked where the accident occurred, which is very suspicious. So he inquires with the police officer about why Sandy would be out there and states that they never go out there, presumably before he knows where Sandy even is. Tom has an answer for everything. Anything the police throws at him, he's going to throw back a response. And he outright denies to the police that he's had a sexual relationship with Lorna. And he explains away the cards in Lorna's bedroom because he says that they were referring to Christian love and not adulterous love. He said that the sitter was only 14 and was confused about the time and that he had called her before calling the police and not the other way around. And we're talking about they're investigating this a whole lot later. So sure. phone records aren't like they are now. I mean, they couldn't have, they probably couldn't have gone back and gotten them. Sure, because remember, at the time of the accident, I mean, the, the police really treated it as kind of open, shut traffic accident. He also claims that the babysitter was confused about what he was wearing. He said that he put on a polo shirt after the run, but every other time the sitter had seen him, he was usually wearing a shirt and tie, and that she probably got those incidents confused 
And then he claimed that the police officer gave a general description of the location, and that is what prompted him to ask what she was doing out there. And then he was just trying to put the pieces together by determining an exact location. The prosecution has a theory of their own, and they believe that Tom and Sandy went to the bridge where they had a drink, and she received fatal injuries on the bridge. And that's where she was beaten, and her body was thrown over the bridge rail into the water, and that the car was then pushed down the embankment to make it look like an accident. Tom then jogged the seven miles from the bridge back to his office to make it appear that he was never there. He had to change out of his clothes because he would have had dirt and blood on his jogging clothes, and that's what would have prompted him to put his shirt and tie back on. There were no eyewitnesses, no physical evidence, but a lot of circumstantial evidence is what led the prosecution to their theory. The new info on Sandy was presented to a grand jury. The grand jury indicted Tom for first-degree murder of Sandy, and a year and a half after Sandy's death, Tom was charged with her first-degree murder. So let's talk about the trials. We're going to start with the trial for solicitation for the murder of Marty. Now, remember Lorna had talked to her friend Jan? Jan also reveals that in April, Lorna told her she wished something would happen to Marty and to Tom's wife so that they could be together. And then the babysitter, Esther. Now, this is going to be the babysitter for Marty and Lorna. She overheard Lorna on the phone saying she could not wait for Marty to die so she could count the green stuff. A friend of Lorna's also said Lorna once joked about killing her husband and even went to the point at one time during their marriage to have an attorney draw up divorce papers. So we can see this is a not a great marriage. Well, Lorna wound up pleading guilty to two counts of solicitation to commit first-degree murder, and the conspiracy was dropped. And the reason there's two counts of solicitation is they solicited Daryl, who turned them down, and then they went to his brother Dan for the solicitation. But Tom went to trial and pled not guilty. Daryl and Dan both testified in his trial to their involvement. We also find out that both Daryl and Dan, both of the brothers, had had sexual relationships with Lorna. The tapes from the phone call where Daryl called Tom and the meeting with Tom where he was wired up was played for the jury. Now, most of this talking was done in vague terms. Lorna testified in Tom's trial that she gave Dan Carter $5,000 and he in turn gave it to another person who gave it to another person who was supposed to be the hitman in Mississippi. And she also claimed she had been abused by Marty. But Tom, in his trial, he seems from the information he's given police and the answers he has, he seems very confident in himself. And he took the stand in his own trial. And according to articles, most of the testimony was just him explaining what he meant by statements in the phone call recording and when Daryl was wearing a wire. He said the meeting was to discuss the church youth group selling fireworks, which is the same thing that Daryl says he told him when he left the church. Tom was convicted of criminal solicitation to commit first-degree murder and conspiracy to commit first-degree murder, and he was sentenced to two and a half to seven years in prison. Now, he goes on trial for Sandy, the death of his wife, The prosecution presented 72 witnesses and over 100 exhibits. By this point, Tom said he doesn't know what happened to Sandy, but it could have been suicide or possibly Lorna and one of her former boyfriends could have done something to Sandy. He does admit to a relationship with Lorna, but said it did not become physical until after Sandy's death. Now, Sandy died in July, and if you remember, her friend said Lorna was telling her about the affair with Tom back in the spring. He said that they were only physical three or four times before his arrest in March of 1984. 
And we already told you about the evidence that they found to be able to arrest him on Sandy. And that was the same evidence they presented at trial. They also say that Tom and Sandy were having marital issues, you know, the stress from their jobs and three kids. And she had gotten a promotion and she was going to be teaching more classes in the fall. And Tom didn't really like this. He wanted her time more devoted to the family and to the church than to her work in school. And Sandy had even told friends that she felt that her husband did not love her anymore. Plus, he was having an affair with Lorna. In August of 1985, Tom was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. So we talked about the trial for conspiracy and solicitation in Marty's death. They haven't been charged for the murder of Marty yet. It took them several years, and it wasn't until 1990 that the prosecution finally had enough evidence to take Tom and Lorna to trial for the murder of Marty Anderson. And Lorna cooperated with the prosecution, and she was able to plead to second-degree murder and got a sentence of 15 years. The prosecution, though, worried about Lorna's credibility because she had told various versions of events and had initially lied about what happened, but they put her on the stand anyway. And Lorna tells the jury that she and Tom planned it together. She said they were sexually involved by the spring of 1983 before Sandy's death or Marty's death. Tom had said to Lorna that she was not what he needed in a wife, but he could make her into what he needed. She said that that money, the $5,000 that she gave to Dan Carter for the hit on her husband, came from Tom, and it was part of life insurance proceeds he got when Sandy died. Lorna testified it was Tom Bird who was the masked man that shot her husband in the head with a 22 caliber handgun that she had given to him. The trial concludes with Tom Bird being found not guilty of Martin Anderson's murder. And that's probably because, as you mentioned, Lorna's testimony isn't very credible. Now, in dealing with his conviction on Sandy's murder, Tom files an appeal, and he appeals that conviction based on the fact that he claims that he had evidence that it was suicide. The week before her death, Tom and Sandy were at a marriage convention with two other ministers and their wives. They were all discussing life insurance, and they all heard Sandy say if she were to ever commit suicide, she would make it look like an accident so her family would still get the life insurance money. Sandy had told the wives that she was concerned about her husband spending so much time with his secretary, Lorna, and seemed somewhat depressed. That's what Tom claims in his appeal, but the appeal was subsequently denied. So after they went to prison, Tom and Lorna, they had no further contact with one another. But I want to tell you about them in prison. Let's start with Tom. They say he has been a model prisoner. He co-founded Convicts for Christ. He organized various events. He started a marriage enrichment seminar for inmates and their spouses with his new wife. So let me tell you about Tom's wife that he married while he was in prison. Her name is Terry, and she was a preschool teacher in Kansas City, and they wed in a prison ceremony in 1988. They had actually met at a church function not long after Sandy's death, but before Tom went to prison. In 2001, after 15 years, Tom came up for parole, but he was denied. The reason for the denial was because of his inability to take responsibility of his crimes. He was still saying, I'm innocent. I did not do this. In 2004, came up again, and he was released from prison and came off of parole in 2006. Now, at this point, he moved to Wyandotte County with his wife, Terry, and he still denies any involvement in Sandy's death. And the last thing I could find on Tom is that he was working as a marriage counselor. So let's talk about Lorna in prison. In 1985, prior to any of her convictions, she married Randy Eldridge, but they divorced in 1990. In 2004, 
she married Terry Moore. And Terry Moore was the campus director of Youthville. And Youthville did work with Florence Crittington Services, which is where one of Lorna's daughters was living. And Florence Crittington Services is basically a, this service for at-risk youth, and they can live there kind of like a group home. But they were married by proxy, which is where you have someone stand in for you, and Lorna was on the phone during the ceremony. In prison, she took parenting classes, earned a college degree with honors from the University of St. Mary. She came up for parole several times and was denied. In 2007, Lorna was released from prison and came off of parole or state supervision in 2014. Now, if you're listening to the dates, Lorna ended up spending more time in prison than Tom, but she had no conviction for Sandy's murder, and she pled on her husband's murder, but she ended up spending more time actually in prison. In the last few years, Lorna has been appointed as CEO of Interfaith Housing Services in her hometown of Hutchinson, Kansas, and this is 11 years after her release. She has been part of the Interfaith Housing Services for nine years prior to her appointment, and they said it was just a great fit. She still lives in Hutchinson, where she's close to her family, and she now has 12 grandchildren. So a couple of footnotes to this case. As I mentioned earlier, the TV miniseries Murder Ordained was based on this case and actually filmed in the town where it occurred. And one other footnote is the Rocky Ford Bridge, which is now referred to as Bird Bridge after Sandy Bird. So this was one of those cases that we started out going one way and we did a U-turn and then cut across the median and took a left turn and went back. It was really twisty turny and had a lot to it, but we tried to present the facts of it as best we can find. With older cases, sometimes it's harder. But again, like I said, Tom still claims his innocence. And even now, Lorna, the last article I saw on her was in 2017, she admitted to her part and said, hey, I, you know, I did some bad things. It's up to you as to what you believe. We hope you enjoyed this week's case, and as always, we'll see you next week. We would like to hear your thoughts on this and all of our cases, and as always, you can reach us by email at truecrimeoutloud at gmail.com, Facebook and Instagram at truecrimeoutloud, outloud is two words, not one, and Twitter at tcoutloud. Photos, links, and sources for this case can be found on our website at www.truecrimeoutloud.com.